Hi and welcome back. In this session of contemporary Indian philosophy, we discuss Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi was a visionary in the true sense. He was a man of incessant activity, a down-to-earth person, whose greatest contribution to modern thought lies in his insistence that man is fundamentally a spiritual and a moral being and that society is an association of human spirits. Here in this unit, we will have a brief look into the religious and social thought of Gandhi. Religious and social thought. Mahatma Gandhi was not an academic philosopher in the accepted sense of the term. His aim in life was realizing truth and non-violence in thought, word and deed, and this was reflected in his writing, speeches, plans and schemes. He considered different religions of the world based on truth and love as different roads going towards the same goal. Realization of God is only possible through ahimsa or non-violence and adherence to truth. For him, truth and God were synonyms. Through his experiments with truth, he discovered the great ideas of truth and non-violence and preached these to his fellow man. Truth or Ahimsa. Truth or Satya is all pervading in Gandhi's philosophy of social reconstruction. For him, truth is what our inner voice tells us. According to Gandhi, all seekers of truth must have an abundant sense of humility. In the march towards truth, all propensities such as anger, selfishness, hatred, etc. must be suppressed, for otherwise truth would be impossible to attain. The more man controls these tendencies, the nearer he will get to truth. Gandhi distinguishes between absolute truth and relative truth. He says, nobody in this world possesses absolute truth. This is God's attribute alone. Relative truth is all we know. Therefore, we can only follow the truth as we see it. Such pursuit of truth cannot lead anyone astray. He says that truth resides in every human heart. One just has to look for it. The search for truth may be pursued through the love for humanity and for the entire universe. An essential qualification of a seeker after truth is that he will remain steadfast even though the whole world might go against him. His suffering will awaken the goodness within the wrongdoer. Thus, the basic feature Gandhi's concept of truth is that one who adheres to truth must be willing to undergo any amount of suffering, even though he may have to lay down his life in the process. This is the acid test of truthfulness. Deviation from truth under any circumstance whatsoever was not acceptable to Gandhi. Gandhi's whole life was a search for truth and he experimented with it constantly. For Gandhi, it is impossible to find truth without non-violence. Without Ahimsa, it is not possible to seek and find truth. We therefore have to ensure that the concept of non-violence evolves in individuals, societies and nations, thus leading to social reconstructions based on truth and non-violence. Truth is God. Gandhi defines truth in a variety of expressions. He calls it God and also calls it Sat, Chit and Ananda and combines truth, knowledge and bliss in God. There should be truth in thought, word and action and one who has realized it becomes perfect as all knowledge is included in truth. Here we see that God and truth are sought to be identified in Gandhian thought. He had his own reasons for saying that God is truth. By identifying God with truth, Gandhi believed that he was finding a name for supreme being because God had no other definite description. He also described God as truth as he believed that God alone is real and so by calling God truth, he wanted to assert that God alone is. As an imbiber of the Upanishadic lore, Gandhi views truth as being coexistent with consciousness or chit. So chit is associated with the name of God. Where there is chit, there exists bliss or ananda. Thus he accepts God as Satchidananda. Later, Gandhi realized that the statement God is truth is only partial and asserted that truth is God. He believed that the reverse statement is all inclusive and all pervasive. He said, but deep down in me, I used to say and thought God may be God. God is truth above all. But two years ago, I went a step further and said, 
truth is God. And I came to the conclusion after continuous and relentless search after truth. Here also we can see that Gandhi had his own reason for this change. One reason is that the word truth is not as ambiguous as the word God. Another reason was, as he said, reason can raise arguments against the possibility of God's existence, but it cannot reject truth. Even skeptics cannot deny truth, so theists and atheists can be brought onto a common platform if truth is considered to be God. Gandhi considered that damage to mankind caused by blind religious notions regarding God can be prevented through this shift of focus. Although Gandhi equates truth with God, this concept is devoid of theological implication. He thought that this could become the basis for a universal religion and could bring persons of different caste, creed and religions together. For Gandhi, ahimsa or non-violence was the practical expression of truth. Truth was the end and ahimsa was the means to that end. He wanted to realize the goal of truth through ahimsa and viewed them as the two sides of the same coin which could not separate it. Gandhi was convinced that an individual could achieve perfection not by sacrificing truth but by sticking to it. The social workers search for truth by their service and a scientist's quest of truth is by means of empirical experimentation. According to Gandhi, through this search, we are serving God. Thus, we see that truth is the highest ideal in Gandhian thought and he views it in the most comprehensive sense. Nonviolence or Ahimsa Gandhi's greatness as a leader and thinker lay in his transformation of the individualistic message of non-violence into a success technique of direct action. He attempted to apply the theory of Ahimsa initiated by the old Indian teachers and prophets on a social, economic and political plane. Gandhi said, I have nothing new to teach the world. Truth and non-violence are as old as the hills. All I have done is to try experiments in both. For him, non-violence is the means and truth is the end. The pursuit of non-violence is inevitably bound with truth. Explaining the transition from the notion of truth to that of Ahimsa, he says, Ahimsa and truth are so intertwined and that it is practically impossible to disentangle and separate them. They are like the two sides of a coin or rather a smooth, unstamped metallic disc. Who can say which the observe is and which is the reverse? Ahimsa is the means, truth is the end. Means to be means must always be within our reach. And so Ahimsa is our supreme duty. If we take care of the means, we are bound to reach the end, sooner or later. This Gandhi interprets truth and non-violence as synonymous terms which cannot be separated from each other. Gandhi does not use the term Ahimsa in the conventional sense of abstaining from killing or hurting a living being. Instead, he emphasized certain aspects of Ahimsa which had not been given that much importance earlier and made the word uniquely his. As per Gandhi, the word Ahimsa has both negative and a positive import. The positive aspect of its meaning is more fundamental for Gandhi because it comprehends the negative aspect and also represents its essence. The usual meaning of Ahimsa is non-killing or non-injury. Gandhi was influenced by Jainism, which recommends the practice of Ahimsa in thought, word and deed. He however differed slightly from the conventional meaning and was of the opinion that killing or injury to life can be an act of violence only under certain conditions such as anger, pride, hatred, selfish consideration, bad intention, etc. Any injury to life done under these motives is himsa. Thus, the negative meaning of ahimsa is non-killing or non-injury. But this presupposes that a non-violent act is free from hatred, anger, malice and the like. Non-violence or ahimsa is hence equally comprehensive and represents the total neutralization of violence in all forms. In its positive aspect, ahimsa is nothing but love. Ahimsa is not merely the act of reframing from doing offense, injury and harm to others, but represents the ancient law of self-sacrifice and constructive suffering. Gandhi interpreted it as signifying utter selflessness and universal love. 
the ultimate aim of ahimsa is to love even one's enemies or opponents ahimsa thus is equivalent to positive compassion and love love is a kind of feeling of oneness it demands a sincere effort to free the mind from feeling like anger malice hatred etc because these create obstacles in the way of love love according to gandhi is the energy that cleanses one's inner life and uplifts and encourages noble feelings such as benevolence compassion tolerance generosity kindness etc gandhi wanted india to follow the doctrine of non violence not because she was under political subjection but because india had an imperishable soul which could rise above all weakness for india ahimsa as a social and political technique meant a pulling together of the energies of the people for the purpose of national liberation non violence applied to international politics signified a spiritual substitute for struggle and war and the consequent eradication of bloodshed caused by it in face of the advancement of nuclear energy gandhi resorted to techniques of promoting brotherly love because he was deeply concerned about the survival of man he thus remained thoroughly devoted to the principle that increasing adherence to ahimsa alone would emancipate mankind from kinds of conflict and evil gandhi regards non violence as the law of the human species and as a creed it has to be all pervasive the application of non violence in economic and political fields is the unique contribution of gandhi who claims that society is held together by the law of non violence philosophy of ends and means gandhi maintained the means determined the end the end however great it may be did not justify the means being wrong in order to achieve a good end the means should also be good bad means were never successful in the long run gandhi said as the means so the end in a way his unique contributions to the world lie in his maintaining that the means are more important than ends gandhi's emphasis on means rather than the end is based on the doctrine of nishkama karma of gita it holds that a person has control over his actions and not on their fruits gandhi argues that we have control only over the means the end is beyond our control thus if we take care of our means the end will be assured he argued that they say means are after all means i would say means are after all everything there is no wall of separation between means and ends indeed the creator has given us control over the means none over the end realization of goal is an exact proportion of that of the means this is a proportion that admits of no exception therefore in gandhi's philosophy of life means and ends are used as convertible terms pure ends requires pure means and pure means will necessarily result in pure ends according to gandhi the end justifying the means is a dangerous practice and is unsound ethically if accepted it permits recourse to violence fraud untruth and opportunism he said that a tree sprouting from a seed of poison cannot bear fruit with juice of nectar he was convinced that permanent good can never be the outcome of untruth and violence so he maintained that violent methods cannot be used to serve even the noblest causes by considering means and ends as a continuous process he dissolved the age old opinion of viewing both as water tight compartments the difference between them is imaginary which is why gandhi takes them as an organic whole in a way he proposes that means and end must be homogeneous that is the end progressively realizes itself through the means this shows that he was almost convinced that ends do not justify the means and that purity of means is an essential condition for realizing good ends this philosophy of end and means has a direct relation with his doctrine of truth and ahimsa truth is the ideal of life according to gandhi and it is the goal towards which we must strive the way to approach it is ahimsa if truth is the end ahimsa is the only means we cannot attain it by any other way in accordance with this gandhi insisted that if swaraj was the end the means adopted for it must be non violence he said violent means will give violent swaraj that would be a menace to the world 
and India itself. Thus, we see that Gandhi always recommended that if the goal of truth is to be attained, the means has to be pure and it has to be the means of ahimsa. Gandhian concept of a universal religion. Mahatma Gandhi cannot be regarded as the founder of a new religion in the actual sense of the term. He learned simply the principles or eternal truths from the greatest traditional philosophical texts and religious teachers of the world. He held that our scriptures have laid down certain self-evident truths as maxims of life. He advised us to live according to these maxims in order to lead a religious life. His contribution lays in the fact that he tried to assimilate his own way the teachings that appealed to him and to apply these teachings not only in his personal life but also to social, political and economic problems. Gandhi said, man without religion is a man without roots. Therefore, religion is the basis on which life structure has to be erected if life is to be real. So he dedicated all his works social, political and economic to the name of God. Gandhi inherited a deep faith in religion from his family traditions. All his great ideas about truth, non-violence, service, renunciation, morality, etc. are commonly found in all religions. The well-being of a man is the touchstone of every religion and it was central to Gandhian thought. Romain Rowland once remarked, to understand Gandhi's philosophy, it should be realized that his doctrine is like a huge edifice composed of two different floors of grades. Below is the solid groundwork and basic foundation of religion. On this vast and unshakable foundation is based his political and social philosophy. Religion according to him was not merely a means for personal purification, but it was an immensely powerful social bond. Gandhi's religious ideas were derived from the conviction that there is only one reality, that of God, who is the embodiment of truth. As religions are defined as devotion to some higher principle or power, Gandhi stated, let me explain what I mean by religion. It is not the Hindu religion, but the religion which transcends Hinduism, which changes one's very nature, which binds one indissolubly to the truth within and whichever purifies. It is the permanent element in human nature, which counts no cost too great in order to find full expression and which leaves the soul utterly restless until it has found itself, known its maker and appreciated the true correspondence between the maker and itself. From the given explanation, we can understand that for Gandhi, religion is not just a theoretical concept that seeks to satisfy intellectual curiosity and urges. It is the way of life and practical necessity for him. Therefore, he says that religion should pervade every aspect of our life. For Gandhi, religion and morality were synonymous terms. Religion enables man to have a glimpse of God and it is impossible to achieve this without a fully developed sense of morality. He said, as soon as we lose the moral basis, we cease to be religious. There is no such thing as religion overriding morality. Man, for instance, cannot be truthful, cruel and incontinent and claim to have God in his sight. Religion signifies to him belief in the supreme moral law that governs the whole universe. He was primarily interested in the ethical aspect of religion. Thus, in Gandhian thought, to reconstruct the society on a non-violent basis, moral discipline of the individual was necessary. Gandhi recommends that the attitude towards different religions must be one of tolerance and respect. He found examples of truth and non-violence in all religions. He believed that different religions were just different ways of apprehending the truth. He held that every religion contains good percepts and noble teachings, but some people's interpretations and commentaries have degraded religion and distorted it. To sum up, we can say that universal religion envisaged by Gandhi breaks down the barriers between one faith and the other. He drew out the best from all religions and framed his concept of religion which contributed to the national integration, progress, mutual cooperation and peace in India and world over. Sarvodaya The idea of Sarvodaya is the apex of Gandhian socialism. 
it advocates the concept of organic unity where all individuals have equal importance and the rise of everyone is dependent on the rise of every other. Gandhi's Sarvodaya ideal thus implies universal welfare and integrated development of all. It is a philosophy which provides a check against the imperfections of the human mind and ensures uniform development of all. The word Sarvodaya is a Sanskrit word and it comprises of two terms, Sarva which means all and Udaya which means rising. Thus the etymological meaning of Sarvodaya is the rising of all. Gandhi's definition of Sarvodaya means universal upliftment or welfare of all men and not just at the welfare or greatest happiness of the greatest number. Sarvodaya aims not at the rise of a few or many or for the rise of the greatest number. It stands for the good of one and all, of the high and the low, of the strong and the weak, the intelligent as well as the dull. The utilitarian school supports the majority, totally neglecting the minority. In comparison with Sarvodaya, it shows a lack of dignity and humanity because Sarvodaya educates the welfare of all, irrespective of class, caste, creed, color, race and religion. It rejects the theories which aim at the joy of a few. It is a more dignified and human doctrine. There are many sources from which Gandhi developed his concept of Sarvodaya. These include John Ruskin's Unto This Last, Leo Tolstoy's The Kingdom of God is Within You, Henry David Thoreau's Civil Disobedience, The Bhagavad Gita, Ishava Shyobanishad, Buddhism, Jainism, Islam, Christianity, etc. Sarvodaya is a spiritual idea according to which socio, political, economic and ethical religious forces work together in harmony to facilitate the attainment of the aspirations of each and every individual in the society. A study on the nature of Gandhian Sarvodaya society reveals his clear cut view on social, political and economic orders which are closely interrelated and interdependent. Concept of Varna Dharma in Gandhian thought. The law of Varna Dharma that presents a structure of value and functions for the personal and social justice can be traced back to the Vedas. It is based on the belief that a healthy social life must be based on a sincere feeling of cooperation and division of work. Gandhi wanted to give a new meaning and significance to the Varna system in the social sphere. He used Varna Dharma as a means to promote human welfare. He held that Varna Dharma is inherent in human nature and there are mainly four types of Varnas that is Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra and these confer duties not privileges. He said that it is a law designated to set free man's energy for higher pursuits on life. He defended this system in the sense that there were certain social functions or duties which were related to one's order or status in society. Man was expected to develop his hereditary skills and thereby follow the vocation of his forefathers. As pointed out by Glyn Richards, the law of Varna as he, the Gandhi called it, resulted from a realistic appraisal of the fact that men are not born equal in the sense that they do not all have the same abilities. Some are born with definite limitations which they cannot be expected to overcome and what the law of Varna does is to ensure that each man is provided with a sphere of activity which establishes for him a place in society and guarantees that his labours are rewarded. In this sense, the law of Varna was a good thing and it was Gandhi's conviction that the ideal social order would evolve only when the implications of the law were understood. Thus, according to Gandhi, the Varna system was a healthy division of work based on birth. To put it in Gandhi's own words, Varnashrama, as I interpret, satisfies the religious, social and economic needs of a community. Observance of the law deviates social evils and entirely prevents the killing of economic competition. It ensures the fairest possible distribution of wealth. But when people in disregard to the low mistake duties for privileges and try for self-advancement, it leads to confusion of Varna and ultimate disruption of society. Gandhi makes it clear that Varna reveals the duty one has to perform and so the question of superiority or inferiority does not arise here. It carries within it 
the spirit of duty and service to which one is born. The factor of heredity in it is significant because it helps to avoid the possibility of rift and strife by ensuring fresh distribution of work every day. All the above said merits of the Varna system were later misinterpreted and it gave rise to the caste system as it exists today. Gandhi was not in favor of the caste system and considered it as an excrescence upon Varna which had to be weeded out. The caste system according to him is a man-made institution and had no religious basis. Gandhi was against the gradation of high and low that existed in the caste system. Therefore, Gandhi made a strong plea for the abolition of all evils and injustice that existed in the name of the caste system. He pleaded for the restoration of the original Varna system as he thought it would lead to true socialism. He believed that if these divisions of Varna system are understood properly, it would go a long way to build a strong and moral society. Untouchability, a crime against God and man. Gandhi laid emphasis on human equality and so his desire for removal of untouchability was as strong as his desire for freedom. Through his writings and speeches, he emphasized the problems of untouchability and the need to remove it from its roots. He called it the curse for society. He maintained that as originally conceived, Varna Dharma had nothing to do with idea of untouchability. He held that untouchability as it is practiced in Hinduism is a sin against God and man and is therefore like a poison slowly eating into the very vitals of Hinduism. This clearly indicates that Gandhi was very much concerned about untouchability which was prevalent in Hinduism in the name of the caste system. Keeping to the ideals of social and political justice and equality, he vehemently condemned it as an impassable barrier in the path of India's progress. He strongly advocated that without social and material improvement of those people who are treated as untouchables, India cannot attain true Swaraj. Removal of untouchability means love for and service of the whole world and it thus merges into Ahimsa. He considered untouchability as the greatest blot on Hinduism. According to Gandhi, there was immorality, injustice, inequality, inhumanity and soul destroying nature in the practice of untouchability. God did not create men with a badge of superiority or inferiority. No scripture labels a human being as inferior or untouchable because of his birth as this is a denial of God. So Gandhi instead of calling these people untouchables named them Harijan or men of God. To Gandhi, one way of removing the curse of untouchability was to bring about a change in our everyday context. He viewed untouchability as a moral problem and believed that it could be mitigated only by change in the hearts and minds of Hindus. He felt that this feeling could not be removed by the force of flow, but the changes had to come voluntarily from the heart. Gandhi was not in favor of legislation for the upliftment of the untouchables. Gandhi appealed to the dominant caste to learn, to respect human values and to treat all equally, focusing on the removal of untouchability, gaining access to the temples, imparting education for children of lower caste, dignity of labor and village reconstruction. He wanted to bring about the social and material improvement of the Harijans. For this, he tried to bridge the gap between the upper and the lower caste. Thus, Gandhi's attitude towards untouchability springs from his basic conviction that we are all one in that we share the same Atman or soul. Sarvodaya in Gandhi's view include the welfare of the untouchables in Hindu society and the restoration of their human rights. Though Gandhi could not abolish the practice of untouchability, through his efforts, he was to make the practice of untouchability less socially acceptable. Gandhi had great, Gandhi had great regard for ethical ideals. Truth and nonviolence form the two pillars on which the edifice of Gandhian philosophy is placed. 
he held that if the goal of truth is to be attained, the means has to be pure and it has to be the means of ahimsa. The social thoughts of Mahatma Gandhi was based on his spiritual interpretation of human nature and society. He launched movements not only against foreign domination, but also against all the social evils and atrocities, customs, norms and values which were justified in the name of India's age old traditions. Hence, some of his important social ideals and programs for social reconstructions include the establishment of Sarvodaya society and universal religion, removal of untouchability, importance he gave to ethical ideals like truth and nonviolence, etc. Before we attend the next unit, please try to answer the following questions. Explain Gandhi's view on Varna Dharma. What are the main features of Sarvodaya? Explain its main differences from utilitarianism. Briefly explain the importance of truth and nonviolence in Gandhian thought. Here are some books of references for you. Religion and Gandhian Philosophy, Manisha Barua, Agangsha Publishing House, New Delhi, 2002. Reading Gandhi, Jolie S.K., Concept Publishing House, New Delhi, 2006. Sarvodaya and Freedom, Gandhian Appraisal, K.M. Ratnam Chetty, Discovery Publishing House, New Delhi, 1991. Gandhian Theory of Social Reconstruction, Parameshwari Dayal, Atlantic Publishers, 2006, New Delhi. Thank you for watching this program. Hope this session was informative for you. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.